All right, thanks, Vijay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, the, I think this is my first talk at Chennai Pi Auditorium here. Anyways, uh, what will be my talk about? Talking about object oriented paradigms in Python. Well, uh, this is known to most of us. Most of us learn Python as an object oriented language. And, you know, when you started working on Python, most of you would have, most of us would have said that, yes, it's object oriented, it's dynamic, it's more practical, and all that. But unfortunately, a lot of us who did our academics, would have started our first object oriented programming not in Python. Any of you who have uh, started object oriented programming starting with Python here in the audience? Well, that's interesting. That's really nice. <laughs> but most of us started object oriented programming unfortunately, unfortunately, with statically typed languages like Java, C++, C Sharp and so on, right? But anyways, I would not say that they are bad, but uh, uh, you know, they involve a lot of work before you actually understand the paradigms of code, right? So, as really like most of us think the best way to write an object oriented programming was to start creating a class. Why I say this is whenever I deliver trainings at various companies as a corporate trainer, when I teach Python, the first question they ask is, oh, you said uh, Python is object oriented? Yes, I say 100% object oriented and then they ask, how can you create a program without a class? Real world object orientation doesn't mean creating classes, instantiating them and then invoking methods. They're much more than to it, right? So you look at this. The first thing I would tell you is that, you know, if you have to do the Java way, I've written a Java program there. Sorry if there's any syntax errors in it. I hope it's not there. But uh, if I have to say hello world in Java, okay, I you know if you read uh, James, Gos James Gosling book, Java programming language, one full chapter is devoted to teach how this program works. The Pythonic way, you simply say print hello world, right? So this is practicality, beats purity, right? That's one of the interesting traits of Python Zen. Now, to understand object oriented paradigms in Python, we need to know about what you call as Pythonisms. So what are these Pythonisms, right? We'll, I'll tell you one, of, one by one of them. First thing, in Python, I told you Python is a 100% pure object oriented language. What I mean to tell you here is that anything and everything in Python is an object. Most of us think that, you know, uh, methods are ingredients of an object, right? We say you have an object, an object has methods. In Python, you create a function, maybe a silly function I'm creating, like say a square function, which will just return square of uh, any number. The function is a first class object. Technically, when you define a function, what you create is a variable. The variable name is called square. Or if it's a variable, that means you can do, uh, we can do a lot of things with it. For example, I can say a is equal to square, which also means I assigned a function to another variable. So I can say a of 10. It still works. If I don't like this function in memory, I can delete it. Right? So as I told you, if I can touch, I can destroy it. Functions being first class objects allows you to create functions dynamically in runtime, pass those functions to another function as an argument, which allows functional programming paradigms very well. A function can return a function, right? And you can surely change how a function works. For example, most of us know that uh, range function is inefficient. Right, so if I have a lot of, if I have a Python program, it's got a lot of uh, places where you put for i in range of hundred, for i in range of thousand. You know, it's painful to go and change uh, every location of range with uh, an efficient variant called exchange. So what I do in the beginning of the Python program is I say range is equal to exchange, and I'm done. So I can say range of ten is now exchange of ten. Right. So what applies for user-defined functions also apply for all the built-in functions too. Some people think it's a danger, but that's how Python is. You know what you're doing, right? So this is, so anyways, I told you about function being a, a variable, functions, uh, function names are variables, class names are variables. Oh, did I say class name is a variable? Yes, classes themselves are first class objects. If I just say class and just specify user pass, I can say staff is equal to user. Oh, I didn't instantiate anything. So there are two class, two, two variables, both referring to user. Okay, sorry. Staff and user refer to the same class. So either I can say S is equal to staff or U is equal to user. Both mean the same, right? So I'm instantiating the user object in both cases. It allows you to rename classes, which also means you can pass class to a function. A, fun a function can create a class and return it. I'm sure in Python tutorial or seen this uh, factory method or a factory function, right, which tells you the factory, factory method pattern where you have a function called object factory which creates a class and instantiates an object and delivers to the user. So you can do all these wonderful things simply because classes themselves are first class objects, right. 
Not just that, even modules are objects. Well, what, that, what does it mean? We know what Python modules are, reusable libraries in Python. For example, I can see import sys here. So sys, you might think is a module, but sys is a variable referring to a module object. So I don't like the name sys, so I can call it as system is equal to sys and say system dot, you know, I can say something like version info or version or something as such. So I can say dir of system2. This comes to an interesting conclusion, right? We just saying Python is number two. All identifiers are references to objects. What you see here is that in all the previous examples, I showed you how to create variables, right? So all of these are creating variables. Either you say a is equal to 10 or if you say def square or say class user or even if you say um, things like uh, import or module name, technically you are defining a variable. And variable definition can happen anywhere, right? It, can not, it may not have to be right at the beginning of the program. There's nothing wrong in Python in importing a module inside a function. And yes, the advantage is that modules are only loaded once in memory. So modules are singletons. So even if you import a module 100 times, it's only loaded once, right? The variable defines a the scope there, right? The variables maintain the scope. So I told you that all identifiers are reference to objects. Python has four different types of identifiers. What are identifiers? Labels, right? Names. You can either create a variable which is done by using assignment or creating a class or creating a function, right? Or you can also talk about objects attributes. What are they? Suppose if I have a, coming back to the example where I have this user, it's an object, right? User is a class. I said u is equal to user. I instantiate an object. Let me go back to the beginning. I say class user pass this is an empty class. u is equal to user where I instantiate an object called user from this class. Nothing stops me from telling u.name is equal to John, u.city is equal to Chennai, right? And u.role u. is equal to, you can say admin or something, right? What you effectively did here is you add ingredients to an object. These are what you call as instance attributes. Most of us who come from other language like C++ and Java mix up variables and attributes. You have heard about this terminology called member variables. Some people even confusingly use the terminology called instance variables. Well, in Python, you only say objects, attributes, or variables are two different things. Variables have scope, attributes do not have scope. That's why you don't have this public, private, protected uh, features in Python. Encapsulation is not that way. You know, there are better ways to do encapsulation, not by using public, private, protected mechanisms, right? So, when I say u dot name, this technically accessing an attribute of an object. This attribute is a name, right? This is an identifier. When I say u dot city, when this is an identifier, this also is an attribute, isn't it? So this means that, think about it. When I say some arbitrary identifier over here, I'm trying to refer to a variable which is not defined. When I try to print this, you get a runtime error called name error. Name error is raised when you try to access a variable that is non-existent. But when you say u dot, let's say country, you don't get name error, you get attribute error. The proof to show you that object dot attribute are different than variables, but they are identifiers. Another form of identifier could be indices of a sequence. When I use the word sequence, generally it's like, you know it, list, tuple, byte array, right? So all these are sequences, isn't it? So, or deck. So if I have created something like say, uh, a of zero is equal to, I say a is equal to a uh, list maybe, uh, 10, John, Sam, whatever it is. If you say A, A of 0 is 10. Sorry, mistake, my mistake. A of 0, close square bracket, 10. A of 1, it shows John. If I say A of 1 is equal to Smith, technically, this is also an identifier. It's an index of a sequence. And what is an index of a sequence? Referring to some string object, or referring to a numeric object. So whatever you see on the right hand side should resolve to some object. All right hand side expression will resolve to some object. If they don't resolve to an object, by default, the left hand side identifier will point to none. I guess you know what none types are useful for, right? That, that derives from the next Pythonism which I'm going to talk about. But for now, in this of a sequence or even keys of a mapping, even if you just specify a dictionary, like say info is equal to name Sam and say info of name. You can consider this, though it's not really an identifier, it's an object here. It can be seen like a key, right? The keys are a way of referring to an object. So it's not technically an identifier, but keys of a mapping also refer to objects. So the norm in Python is all as references, all objects are referred to, right? So as I told you, we can just see 
Python is number three says all assignments are assigned by references all objects are passed by references there is no such thing called pass by value in Python if you've done some C C++ programming if you say like a is equal to 10 b is equal to 20 b is equal to a right there are two copies of 10 in memory but in Python when you say a is equal to 10 b is equal to a let me assure you there is only one copy of 10 in memory to confirm id of a and id of b are the same or you can even use a keyword you can use also use the expression a is b it shows it's true is operators to check whether both operands refer to the refer to the same object right some of you might wonder oh, what if i say b is equal to 11 most common question new by question again so what happens to when if you say b is equal to 11 will a be 11 not really b is a label a is also a label i had two labels to one object then I decide that I peel out one of the labels from the object and stick it on another object. The old label still pointing to the old object, isn't it? So we just look at A is still 10, B is pointing to another object, okay? Sorry, A is still 10, B is pointing to another object which is 11, right? Treating everything as references has its own interesting benefits. Like I told you, why copy when you can just simply refer, right? Just a thing. Even when you're passing objects to a function, the objects are never copied to a function, are never copied in any expression, they are all passed by references. Well, some of you might think, oh, that's a problem. Suppose if I just say A is equal to 10, 20, 30 as a list, and B is equal to A, sorry, B is equal to A, A and B are referring to the same list. A list being immutable, if I just say B of 0 is equal to 100, A is now 100. A is also showing that list being muted, right? So it's mutated, I would say, right? You can see A has got 10. Is not changed to 100. This is where you use techniques like you know shallow copy, deep copy algorithms. If you want to make a copy of any object, we say copy constructor in C++. We use clone methods in Java. Python, you don't have to worry about the object knowing how to copy itself. Python figures it out. You simply say from copy import. Either you can say shallow copy or deep copy. Copy or deep copy. And you can just specify C is equal to cop, you know deep copy of a, A, B, C. A of zero is equal to thousand. Would affect? Did I make? No, I didn't make it thousand. Sorry. A of zero is equal to thousand. Would affect A. Would affect B, but not C. C is a duplicate copy. Right? You can copy any objects, not just a list. It can be a dictionary. It can be a list. It can be custom objects also. Right? So this is what it's all about. So I'm just trying to tell you that the Python is number three. It says, uh, everything is assigned by reference, passed by reference. Next. All definitions happen in runtime. Most common things I find is when I see a Python program with a lot of statements in the beginning telling like, you know, A is equal to none, B is equal to none, name is equal to none. I'd infer only one thing. The programmer who wrote them was a Java programmer. <laughs> Most of us take this bad habits of static typing into dynamically typed languages, initializing variables. Why? Oh, if the variables are not initialized, it'll cause errors. Pythonic way, define a variable with useful value and use it immediately there. You don't have to predefine a variable when you don't, when you don't know what you'll, be use, what you'll do with it, right? So things like this is simply unnecessary as a statement. Well, you might say, oh, uh, if I have a function prototype where you use, a, uh, you know, the function prototype, I say default variables, then it's fine. I could say function of some default value is equal to none. That's perfectly fine. But defining a variable as a statement with none is a bad idea. That doesn't show it's Pythonic. Right? So you create variables only when you want to use an object. You decide the object, then the variable. Not the variable, then the object. Think about the going to, like, say, a shopping mall, any of the shopping malls, right? Supermarket. Most of the times we buy, buy products, and most of those products have this uh, sticker labels with a barcode, which use the billing counter. You can't go to the shopping market and say, like, you know, I want to buy the label. You can buy the object based on the label, right? That's the way it is. Anyways. Which also infers one interesting part. Variables on their own are typeless. It's a little confusing. Python has got a strange mix of being dynamically typed and strongly typed. Types are dynamic. Variables don't have a predefined type. I can actually say things like a is equal to 10. Later on, nothing stops me from telling a is equal to hello world. There's a label that's stuck to one object. Peel out that label, stick it to another kind of an object. Python allows you to do that. So variables are typeless. Technically, variables are referring to an object. So technically, you're defining the type of an object. 
So variables in a, in a way inherit the type of an object, derive the type of an object, isn't it? So when you say when if, if a was equal to 10, it points to an integer, so you can actually maybe subtract it by 5 or maybe you can multiply by 5. If a is referring to a string, you can repeat it 5 times, right? This is what this is all about. So this type dynamicity gives you a lot of flexibility in making your code more concise, right? This is what this is. So there, there are just labels to objects, deriving the object's type, but objects are strongly typed. An integer is an integer, a string is a string. You can't mix them, right? That's an inter interesting inference, you know? The next thing, most of us say typecasting. A bad word originating from the language called C. You have an integer, you want to see that integer is a floating point, you type cast to float. You want to see it as a long, you type cast to long, right? You say upcast, downcast, and all kinds of casting that's there. Going back, going to a language like Java, you will type cast amongst objects, classes. You have an object of a subclass, you will type cast to a superclass and use it. Then you upcast it if you know what it is. And worst case, you get a class cast exception error, and you have no idea why that occurred, <laughs> right? But here in Python, there's absolutely no type casting. You only try to say type conversion. An integer is an integer. You cannot see an integer as a floating point. Trust me, you can't. Simple as that. Proof, if I say a is equal to 10, some of you might say, no, I could convert to floating point. Convert, not cast. B is equal to float of a. B is another object. A is another object. Two different objects are created. You read the integer, create a floating point object of it. You don't see that as a floating point object, right? That's the major difference. That's what you can see. So you instead do type conversion or type construction. Okay, that's a norm in Python. Duck typing over type checking. Well, there's a very interesting quote. So many people are confused about duck typing and there's a very interesting quote. It's written by James Whitcomb, really. I didn't know about this and I happened to look up in Wikipedia and found out. I thought the inventor of that uh, quote is uh, Alex Martelli. He was, a, he was the one who popularized this quote in year 2000 in the Python news group. Python was the first language which tried to promote duck typing. Like I say, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, swims like a duck, I call it a duck. Now, there are two ways of looking at object orientation uh, in real world. You have a small kid, maybe a two-year-old, who's just learning to speak. Maybe a three-year-old, let's say, who knows how to speak better. And just looks at, a, looks at one of the birds there and asks, what's that bird, Papa, or what's the bird, Mama? So, what do you do? You say, it's a duck. And how do you say it's a duck? You don't start talking about the genealogy of birds. You don't say it's an avian, uh, uh, no, it's, it's an avian organism and blah, 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 blah. And you don't go do that. You know, you don't create, because that explain hundreds of questions. So easiest way is, you say, it quacks, it can swim, it walks a little differently. So you call it a duck. If you see another bird which just flies and just goes, uh, goes a car, then you call it crow. So you identify an object based on their behavior not based on where they come from, right? You don't really do type checking. That's why, as I told you, Python has no prejudice in telling a into 10, in this case, a is an integer, or hello into 10, it's a string, right? That means this string has this operator supported. I mean, that this particular object, integer object has the operator supported. The string also has this operator supported. You don't care about who you are. You ask, can you multiply? I say, yes, I can, right? This is called as duck typing. You identify or you figure out how to interact with an object based on what they support, what features they support, right? In fact, you can find out what they support by always looking up things. So you can just say dear of A, dear of, uh, you know, maybe hello, for example, then you get to know what attributes support it. Or worse, you are better, I would say, uh, if I say A is equal to 10 and say B is equal to maybe a list, I can say has ATTR of A and I can just specify maybe underscore underscore mul. You know, it's like asking, can you multiply? Yes, it says yes. Has ATTR of B and say mul. Both of these can multiply, right? But however, if I just provide some other object, like say, you know, uh, maybe um, C is equal to none, for example, it's a bad, bad example, but keeping it simple. And if I just say has ATTR of C and say mul, it's a false. A none cannot multiply, which means you can't say C into 4. It doesn't work. This way of finding out what an object is capable of before dealing with it is what you call as a duck typing. 
You don't care about the type. I don't care what type it is. I check, can you support this particular method? Do you have so and so attribute? Right? That's how it works. So, the next Pythonism I should also tell you is about introspection versus inheritance. What is introspection versus inheritance? In Python, just like duct typing, as I told you, the duct typing features, you introspect the object. You don't worry about that inheritance hierarchy. Most other programming languages emphasize on inheritance. You know, you create abstract classes, then you create a lot of uh, other sub-abstract classes, then you actually create some concrete implementations, then you use interfaces, you use prototypes, and so much of complexity. Before you even decide to write a single line code that works, you'll worry about all the inheritance design, whereas in Python, you figure out by introspection. Just as proof, let me tell you, list, tuple, and let's say a string, they all have some common attributes. They're all sequences. You can iterate on all of them, but they don't fall in the same inheritance hierarchy. Right? They don't fall in the same inheritance hierarchy. So is float and integer. You can create your own object having all these common attributes and they automatically are introspection. By introspection, you can say that this, at this can become a number. Right? If at all I support, uh, if I at all create my own class which suppose add, multiply, subtract, divide, it becomes a number. Right? That's an example. So ask what the object can do, not where they come from. Right? The next thing, generalize functions over interface methods. When I say generalized functions, most people ask this new by question. If I say Python is fully object oriented, how come there's some built-in functions like say lin? Should that be called a dot length? Well, I, my answer to that is this. This phone, which I'm carrying with me, has certain methods. Like I can turn on, turn on the screen, I can swipe, I can make phone calls, I can receive SMS. Attributes of phone. Mm, I can, I don't have any other object. I have a laptop here. A laptop allows certain methods. Different objects have different set of methods implemented. The phone does not have a throw method, but I can still throw a phone. The laptop does not have a throw method, still I can throw it. There are certain functionality which need not have to be implemented in the object, which are cross-cutting functionality, right? So you can definitely say len of a, which means, does this object have length? Yes, if it's got, it'll introspect it. If I say a is equal to 10, 20, 30, 40, len of a still works. ID of A, if, if I say um, A is equal to 10, B is equal to maybe a list, right? This ID is a function which works irrespective of your object, which means each object does not have to deal with how to implement them in most cases, right? This is, why, this is the reason why you have generalized functions over having to implement interface methods. You, to, Im to emulate this functionality in Java, use the interfaces, you know, callable interface, iterable interface, and so on, right? You don't have to worry about that. It's pretty simple. You just look up an attribute. If, it's call, if, an, if an object has an attribute called double underscore writer, double underscore, it's an iterable object. Simple as that, right? That's what this is. So, this is about it. And the last thing is succinctness was verbosity. This is the last slide I have. Well, uh, you can consider this practicality versus purity, right? Int of 10, succinctness. Int is a built-in function, take any compatible object, create an integer out of it, type constructor, right? Versus this complicated mess called integer.parseInt. Well, this at least better in Java. Uh, you know, it's C and C++ is even more cumbersome and painful, <laughs> right? Anyways, so it's all about it. There's a small uh, gist I gave you about why Python is object-oriented while having lots of features which are not like, you know, other languages like Java and C++, right? How Python is object-oriented that way. Any questions, doubts, anything at all? And you can contact me here. Any questions at all? I hope I've not uh, over, over, you know, overflown my time here. Time here. Your point there are methods for uh, that apply on every object in Python. Not necessarily every object. Some set of objects which may not fall in the same inheritance hierarchy. For example, type. ID apply on every object, okay. but len does not apply on every object. See, for example, you say a is equal to 10 and you say len of a, it doesn't work. But you say a is equal to hello world, okay, and say len of a, it works. a is equal to, if I just specify a dictionary like this, right, and say len of a, it works. Oh, that doesn't mean that I have to put the dictionary and the string in the same inheritance hierarchy. I don't have to create an interface called len interface, which makes it one more level complicated. So when I'm creating my own uh, class also, if I implement a method called len, it's called double underscore len double underscore, 
which returns a number, that means you can compute the length of my object. Assign it. In a static type languages, you predefine those specifications. In dynamic type languages, you introspect and find out. You can ask, can I compute the length two ways? You say len of a, which says no, I can't. So if b is equal to 10, right? Len of b, you get an exception which can be handled. Or you don't want exception way of doing it, you can introspect it. Though they say, some people argue that's not duck typing. You know, it's like this, you know, you, 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 you pat a duck, it might say quack. You pat a dog, okay, don't try it at home, it might bite you back. <laughs> you definitely don't want to pat a human being, <laughs> right? But duck typing says, you pat to find out what the response is, right? Some of them will raise an exception, some of them will return a proper value. That's true duck typing. But some people, right, they want to be precautionary. Then what do you do? You'll just say, uh, has ATTR of A len. Does this object have length? I can say has ATTR of B len. Does this object have length? Right? So in runtime, you introspect the object. It's like a small kid. To a kid, when you give a small object, which is never seen before, even, you know, even us, normal, normal people like us, maybe I show you a new gadget to you. I don't tell you what it is. What we do? We introspect it. We see a button. We press the button. We see the screen lights on and say, oh, okay, there's some kind of a video gadget. We introspect and find the capabilities. This is a real world object orientation in comparison to playing God that is in statically typed language. We play God, right? Here we play human beings. That's the difference. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Exactly, that's I was talking about uh, here, right? It's a mixture. Types are not to do with variables. In fact, to emphasize more on it, if you say other language like say C++, Java, the variables are like, think about variables are containers. They're not references, they're not labels, they're containers, store value, variable store value, right? The containers are colored, red, blue, green. Red objects in red container, blue objects in blue container, green objects in green container. The variables are colored to store what type of data they can represent. Python variables are labels, not containers. The labels don't have any coloring. You can stick a label anywhere, just like the sticky note, right? So that means variables technically are typeless, but the objects are strongly typed. It's interesting. Any other queries, questions? All right, we'll continue the next talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. So.